Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for all to be here in this session uh, from the wider conference. So we will start the presentation uh, from Oras. Uh, and each one of you have approximately six minutes to do the presentation. And then we, uh, if someone have any question, please uh, write in the Q and A uh, part of the the. You can find that in the your right side that is chat people in the Q and A. You can write there your questions, and in the end we can select some questions to. Um, to ask the participants, and they also can uh, answer in the chat. So please, Oras, uh, you can start your, your presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present um, this paper entitled COVID-19 and Children's School Resilience Evidence from Nigeria. This paper is a joint work with uh, Sylvain Desi, Luca Tiberti, and Marco Tiberti. So basically, in this paper, we're interested to see how COVID-19 affects school dropouts in, in Nigeria. Briefly talk about the motivation. Over the recent month, there has been an increasing amount of research on the impact of COVID-19 on many socioeconomic outcomes, including education, health, food and security, and so on. Addressing this issue is not surprising in the sense that since the beginning of the pandemic until today, the World Health Organization counts more than 200 million of cases of COVID-19. And this includes around 5 million of deaths. So to contain the spread of the COVID-19, governments around the world put in place many restrictive measures. And this includes school closure, border closure, any lockdown measure. This lockdown measure in Nigeria, for example, have a negative impact on household income. So for example, in Nigeria, two thirds of children in our analysis sample are from households whose total income declined after the COVID-19 outbreak. So in developing countries, aggregate income shock increased children vulnerability to child labor or child marriage. So to cultural practice not to undermine school attendance. Given the negative impact uh, of COVID-19 on household income, it's likely that the opportunity cost of households to send their children to school could increase, as Bandera and Koto have shown in Sierra Leone in the context of Ebola. So we are contributing to this literature by showing how COVID-19 affects school dropout. Our second research question is that, does COVID-19 increase gender inequality in schooling? So talking about the data, this research mainly relies on the Nigeria COVID-19 National Longitudinal Full Survey RANCIS. This data is actually a subsample of households that have been interviewed as part of a Nigeria general household survey in 2019. This survey includes information at the individual level before COVID-19 and during COVID-19 after school reopened in Nigeria in October 2020. And this data includes many information, let's say respondent school attendance, their age, their gender, their place of residence, and so on. So to identify the impact of COVID-19 on school attendance, 
we estimate the following individual fixed effect linear probability model. So school attendance is a dummy variable, we take a value of one if uh, the respondent is going to school and zero otherwise. We are measuring this variable before COVID-19 and uh, during COVID-19 after school real. So our main coefficient of interest is alpha zero who capture the impact of COVID-19 on school attendance. So talking about the main results, so we find that COVID-19 lockdown measure reduced children's probability of attending school after the school system reopened. And the impact that we are getting increase with it. What does it mean? This results highlight that Age is a significant factor in how households school attendance decision respond to COVID-19 lockdown measure. So we can see that households are more likely to pull older children out of school than the younger one. So the second result that we, we, we found is that we did not get any gender difference. However, the evidence show that in the child married from Northwest part of Nigeria, COVID-19 increased gender inequality in education among children age 12 to 18. So what does it mean? So given that Northwest Nigeria is one of the regions where child marriage is more prevalent, this result provides uh, suggestive evidence that child marriage in this region may increase due to COVID-19. So policy implication, our paper suggests that public policy to mitigate the adverse socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 should target the school resilience of adolescent girl in setting where child marriage is relatively common. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, your question comments are very welcome. Thank you, Oras. Uh, uh, just to let who arrive in the session uh, after Oras is at the presentation. So if you have any question, you can ask in the Q&A and he can answer there, or we can have a session in the end. So we will continue uh, with, uh, uh, sorry, with Kibro. Uh, please, Kibro, uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, response fatigue in phone surveys, and this is uh, based on experimental data uh, on diet diversity from Ethiopia. So this is a joint work with my colleagues, uh, Gush Burhani from IFRI, John Hordinet uh, from Cornell and Kabram Tafara at the World Bank. So uh, obviously uh, the outbreak of a pandemic like the COVID-19 uh, uh, necessitates um, the need for further monitoring of welfare, out welfare outcomes, including food security. However, uh, we also know that this type of pandemic creates substantial obstacle for survey operations and mainly for running face-to-face -face surveys and interviews. Because of the disruption in uh, survey operations and face-to-face -face surveys, we have seen a lot of increasing interest in remote data collection tools uh, after the outbreak of the pandemic. However, uh, we know quite little about um, the implication of this uh, in terms of um, effects on data quality. So in this paper, we evaluate the overall and differential impact or implication of uh, fatigue in phone surveys. There are several reasons and justifications to uh, argue that um, fatigue is likely to be more pronounced in phone surveys than face-to-face um, than, uh, -face surveys. I'm going to cover the, uh, a lot of this, but I think um, uh, it's, it's arguably um, uh, 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 that phone surveys are more, more prone to, um, to um, 
fatigue compared to face-to-face -face surveys. Um, so here we have the data and the experimental design. We're using two rounds of phone survey um, data. Uh, the first round was collected in June 2020, and the second round was collected in December 2020. And this data builds on a large household survey uh, and mainly uh, a large mother survey uh, that preceded the pandemic, uh, where the primary respondent was the mother or the caregiver of the young child. So in the first phone survey, uh, we reached out to about 1,500 households and mothers. And in our December survey, the second round, we introduced a random assignment of respondents to one of the two questionnaire types that we prepared. That is, 50% uh, of the respondents were assigned to receive um, the instrument on women's diet diversity 15 minutes earlier in the interview. And that's immediately after the introduction of, of the survey. And the remaining 50% uh, uh, were assigned to the control group and they received um, the module 15%, about, uh, sorry, about 15 minutes uh, um, uh, in the interview. And that's similar to what we had in the baseline survey. So here we have some uh, baseline characteristics. I can quickly skip, uh, 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 I only want to mention a couple of points here. You can see that we have a fairly balanced uh, uh, baseline characteristics, and you can see that uh, before the intervention or before uh, the random assignment we did, uh, you can see that mothers uh, in the treatment and control group uh, reported similar uh, diet diversity and also similar um, food groups. Here uh, we have an empirical strategy, which is a straightforward fixed effect specification, where we have Y at the outcome of interest, which is diet diverse score. And then we have uh, individual fixed effect and time dummy, and then the, the treatment indicator. Um, here we have uh, some results. So, uh, so uh, you can see in the first two columns, uh, you can see that matters in the treatment group report consumption of 0.25 more food groups. And this translates to 8.4% uh, uh, reduction in, in diet diversity uh, because of the delay in, in the arrival of the module. And uh, the last two columns show that um, uh, delay in the arrival of the women's module uh, reduces women's meeting a minimum of four food groups by about 28%. Here in this table, uh, we taught that fatigue may entail differential impact uh, by food groups, depending on how frequently these food groups appear in the household menu. Uh, and so we, we split um, the diet diversity uh, uh, questions into several disaggregations. And um, here we have in the first two columns, we have the mostly commonly consumed food items and then the, la the last uh, four columns are uh, for food items that we think are less frequently consumed. Here you can see that um, a delay in the module or in the arrival of the women's uh, dietary, dietary diversity module leads to about 8.6% reduction in the probability of um, reporting consumption of animal source foods. And this translates to about 40% reduction in the share of mothers reporting uh, consuming animal source food. This is substantial uh, uh, reduction. Here we have, um, we report some heterogeneous impacts by uh, respondent characteristics. And what we find is relatively older mothers and uh, those with lower level of education and also those mothers coming from larger households are more vulnerable to fatigue. And there are several intuitive reasons to, to justify uh, these heterogeneous, heterogeneous results. So to conclude, um, we find that delaying the timing of uh, mother's uh, food consumption module by about 15 minutes leads to um, 8 to 17% uh, reduction in diet diverse score or about 40% reduction in the number of mothers reporting uh, uh, consumption of animal source foods. This is substantial. Uh, especially given um, the, the time difference that we are uh, interested in this. So there are several implications uh, um, to, this, to this finding. Um, uh, I'll just mention three of them. Um, the first one is um, 
if a 15 minutes delay in the arrival of a specific module leads to this much of difference, then uh, this implies that comparison of statistics uh, across different surveys or across countries or across time may be confounded by uh, the position of uh, the, the position of modules in this different surveys. Um, secondly, um, you can see that uh, the heterogeneous results that we document uh, imply that fatigue exhibits system or response fatigue exhibits systematic pattern and this will introduce what we call the non-classical measurement error uh, which had a uh, significant inferential implication on on our econometric analysis and finally our findings highlight important trade off between uh, the volume of information to be collected and the quality of data that means uh, researchers would have to carefully trade off between the two uh, the two dimensions uh, to to data uh, quality and also to the, the the side of information thank you let me stop here thank you Kibron. uh so we will follow now with Indrajit. uh so welcome Indrajit, my colleague from the wider summer school <laughs> uh thank you uh, rodrigo uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, UNU Wider for giving me the opportunity to present our paper. And the paper has been co-authored with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mansi and uh, Roshan Thomas. Uh, see this uh, uh, COVID-19 raging uh, across the globe uh, has affected the education sector as well. And as part of the effort to contain the virus, a country has temporarily shut down educational institutions. And as a consequence, the right to education has come to be stalled. And as per the statistics provided by UNESCO early of this pandemic that mid April 2020, 188 countries opted for nationwide closure, which has affected the estimate of over 90% of the total world's enrolled student. And India as a, a country alone accounts for 320 million students have been affected due to the nationwide closure of school on March 25th, 2020. And out of these 320 million students, about 10 million students are studying in primary, pre-primary level, and more than 143 million are studying in primary levels. The most worrying fact is that as the lockdown period increases, academic skills are likely to be affected negatively. And this impact, this elongated, uh, the impact of this elongated interruptions uh, the, the, are unequal. Uh, depending upon the socioeconomic statuses of the uh, students. Having said that, there are several innovative uh, responses to address the unprecedented pandemic that has uh, caused a catastrophe in the education sector. Online platforms uh, are being used as a substitute to continue with the education. However, uh, this uh, the given if this this much importance of this this technology uh, this technology has created a new era of this digital divide and the education is divided between those who own technology and who do, those who do not have access uh, to the technology so with the online classes being concentrated in the urban private school, the gap between urban private school and rest of the uh, rest, uh, rest uh, is expected to increase drastically. Uh, therefore, the objective of this study is to assess the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on primary education in India, explicitly focusing on the differential impact between public and private school going children. So in order to accomplish the objective we have conducted a primary survey comprising both online and offline mode thus our survey covers the 377 sample of parents of both uh, private and public school going children in karnataka state in india and the first descriptive uh, result uh, shows that 
the comparison between the mean study hours between public and private school going children and there is a marginal difference in the study hours at home when study hours at school is added with the study hours at home this difference becomes much it's uh, significant and the but the question arises if uh, the students are allowed to go for uh, online uh, the teaching online uh, the, the, this uh, uh, student learning process then this this uh, school private uh, private public school going children whether they are in a position uh, to access online uh, classes or not and therefore uh, we have made a comparison of access to different resources required for attending online education between public and private uh, the, uh, the school going children and our results this figure too clearly shows that in terms of the availability of different online means such as smartphone ipad computer laptop broadband connection each and every indicator that private school going uh, children account for much higher value as compared to the public school going uh, children and the, even the total the inequality in terms of this access to different resources and the study hours are decomposed between uh, and uh, that decomposed by between and within inequality among public public and private school going children and it has been seen that the between public and private school going uh, children's inequality is much higher as compared to the within uh, inequality but in ad addition to this descriptive analysis uh, to to identify the robustness in the in the in the in the result we have used the econometric analysis keeping this this study hours at home study hours at home and school and access to resources as dependent variable and this choice of school between public and private as the main independent variable keeping other socio economic uh, variables as control variable but here the problem is the choice of school may suffer from this endogeneity problem and therefore following but this uh, this choice of school is a binary variable following ulrich and angst pisk we have first estimated a binary response model while keeping this choice of school as a dependent variable and this nighttime luminosity in the district in our case as the instrument variable and keeping all other constants remains same and then we have used the fitted probabilities from the first stage the from this binary equation in our ultimate 2 SLS model so the main findings based on this econometric analysis is that first stage regression shows that the lifetime luminosity in a district is negatively and significantly related with the choice of government school implying that the choice of school is very much dependent on the region's level of development from uh, the, the less developed region mostly students come from come for this this public uh, 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 schools and the second stage regression our ultimate regression shows that the public school going children study fewer hours at home as compared to the private school uh, going children but that the magnitude of the coefficient increases substantially when school hours are added during the pandemic uh, time. So uh, this, this has intensified the gap between private and, uh, and the public school drastically. And the second uh, the specification shows that the public school going children have lower access to resources that are required to attend online classes. So which is a matter of grave concern if online mode of teaching learning process are implemented for uh, government school. All relationships are, are robust because we have tested with different specification of the variables and the regressions are controlled uh, with the gender, social groups, religion, location, parents, occupations and educational level. So again, uh, this Indrajit, uh, please, uh, I would like to ask you to move to the your final thoughts because we are read our Yes, more than so, okay, seven then, minutes. Yes, final slide. Okay, so the main conclusion is that this pandemic has intensified the gap between public and private school, and this crisis has made us aware of underlying issue which needs to be addressed, starting from the access to resources to implementation of better educational policies, and in this implementation, act 
active involvement of all stakeholders are very important. So with the pandemic, there have been several innovative ways to uh, that with the, in, the, in which children were reached out to address the challenges in the education sector. However, it has to be inclusive of the students belonging every section of the society. Thank you. Thank you, Indrajit, and sorry for no, it's, uh, stopping. It's, it's because we have this yeah, short should. time. No. Um, Elisa, uh, please, you can uh, put your presentation. Hello, my name is Elisa Feilate, and I will present this joint work together with Fiori Katkovic, Mendes, and Machal regarding the impacts of the COVID-19 on higher education for Uruguay. So the aim of this paper is to provide empirical evidence for a developing country such as Uruguay on the effects of COVID-19 during 2020 on educational outcomes of first-year university students. We think that it is relevant to understand the effect of the pandemic on tertiary education since the importance of education for human development and the development of countries. So in order to do this, we will exploit a rich data set coming from different administrative records from the public university in Uruguay to analyze not only the effects of the whole population, but also heterogeneous effects. So to give some context, UDELAR is the only public university in Uruguay, and it is a university where you can study your undergraduate career for free. The university offers around 100 undergraduate degrees and cover 86% of university students in the country. And regarding the situation with COVID-19, it is important to mention that in Uruguay, the academic year starts on March. Therefore, the pandemic arrived at the beginning of the academic year and implied the suspension of in-person classes. But after one month without classes, by mid-April, most of the courses were changed to online courses. What we are going to, to use is uh, two sources of uh, information. On one hand, administrative records regarding educational events of students. And on the other hand, we will use information of the enrollment form completed by students when they enroll to a new career. So we will end with a database that recreates the individual academic trajectory combined with the socioeconomic and sociodemographic information at the individual level. What we are going to do is to compare the first year students from previous years from 2017 to 2019 with the first year students from 2020. The outcomes that we are going to analyze are the probability of being enrolled but not doing any academic activity, the number of courses that the student takes, the number of courses that the student approves, and the mean grade. So here I present the table with the results and what we find is that COVID-19 reduces in approximately three percentage points the student activity versus previous cohorts. And although it's less significant, COVID-19 also reduced slightly the annual number of courses taken by students. However, the class of 2020 on average obtained better scores in comparison to previous generations. When we analyze the results by subgroups, we can see different results. Panel A shows disparities across different parental educational backgrounds, comparing those students with parents with without a university degree and separately those students with parents with university education. Independ independently of the parental education background, students in 2020 reduced their activity in comparison to previous cohorts of students with similar characteristics. Less significant is the effect of COVID-19 on the number of enrolled courses, specifically while students with less educated parents reduced their enrollment in 2020 in comparison to previous generations with similar characteristics, no statistical uh, effect is found for students from better parental backgrounds. However, for the students with more educated parents, we observe an increase of approved courses in 2020, and regarding the average score obtained during the first year, what we observe is that um, students from relatively worse parental edu educational background do better in 2020 than before. In panel B, what we can see is differences by gender. First, note that boys do relatively worse in 2020 than in previous years regarding the probability of not doing any activity. For girls, the result is less significant and also half in magnitude. And in addition, considering the, um, the, the taken courses, boys take less courses in 2020 than in previous years, while no effects are found for girls. For both genders, we do not find significantly effects of COVID on the total number of approved courses. 
in the first year, and on average, girls in 2020 do better than girls of previous cohorts, while boys do slightly similar to previous generations of boys. Finally, we analyzed students coming from a public secondary institutions and those from private ones. We first know that both groups of students decreased their activity in 2020, and in addition, students from private secondary institutions reduced the number of courses taken during 2020, while no statistically significant effects are found for those students from public high schools. In addition, for students from public schools, they increased the number of approved courses, and regarding the scores, students from, from private high schools in 2020 do better than students from the same background in previous years. We don't find statistically significant differences for students from public secondary institutions in 2020 in comparison to previous years regarding the, the mean scores. Overall, this study wants to provide relevant evidence of the potential impacts of COVID-19 in university education outcomes. Our results are, to the best of our knowledge, the first ones to exploit administrative data at the national level for a developing country. The results show an increase in students that enroll, but do not do any activity, and a decrease of the number of courses, but also an increase of the number of approved courses, and an increase of the mean grade for some group of students. And we must stress that in order to disentangle the mechanism behind these effects, we need more data sources that we would like to to exploit in the future, and also we would like to add the results for the first semester of 2021 and also to add more educational effects to understand what is happening in Uruguay regarding the effects of the pandemic on tertiary education. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, so let's go to the uh, last presentation. Please, Christopher, you can uh, share your presentation for us. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the wider conference today and to outline our paper on rebuilding human capital. Over the last year, there's been an enormous volume of work on the economics of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the one hand, there's a body of macroeconomic work that's focused primarily on the short to medium term impact of the, the pandemic and very often feeding into debates about adjustment programs and their financing, whether that be domestic or external. On the other hand, there's a rich body of work that has drawn attention to the impact of the crisis on human capital, on health, skills and education. And this literature explores the effects of the crisis in disrupting labour markets, on skills acquisition, and in particular on the effects of loss of learning in the education system. In addition, it also looks at the effects of the diversion of, of healthcare spending away from primary healthcare and non-communicable diseases, for example, towards addressing the acute effects of the COVID-19 crisis. What we seek to do in this paper is bring together insights from these two literatures in order to assess and quantify the medium term macroeconomic and welfare impacts of COVID-19 in low income countries. And in particular, focusing on the operation through the transmission uh, of the deterioration of human capital formation onto productivity and growth in the medium term. Ultimately, the aim, of course, is to assess the macroeconomic and public finance implications of public policy measures that are aimed at reconstructing skills, health and education capital post-crisis. Our approach is to uh, deploy a dynamic macroeconomic model that uh, we have developed elsewhere. And we calibrate this to a representative low-income country in this paper with a relatively conventional representation of the, of the short-run economic shock associated with COVID, and then extend that to focus in particular on human capital dynamics and the links to growth and productivity in the medium term. On the short-term side, this is an example of the, the approach that we might take. This is taken from an earlier paper where I and others have looked at uh, the shock on Uganda, where against a, uh, a background of, of trend per capita consumption growth, we decompose the shock, that's the vertical bars, into um, direct effects of lockdown measures, the general equilibrium effects from the disruption of the domestic supply side of the economy, and then add in the spillover effects on the demand side operating through the current and capital accounts, the balance of payments, and then using um, uh, this framework to assess the outcomes under different uh, public policy responses. The key point here 
is that whilst we embed this uh, basic framework into our current model, this focuses only on the short term. And what we want to do is build on this to uh, incorporate a, a more plausible representation of the human capital dynamics associated with the crisis. Now, there's an extensive literature on the returns to public investment in education and health, and our core calibration pays very close attention to, to trying to get those um, uh, rates of return and productivity effects right. But the important addition is looking at, at the, the new literature to think about the depth and duration of loss of learning effects and health diversion effects as a result of the crisis. And there's some really exciting work out there that we're able to draw on work from the World Bank, some very interesting work from Michelle uh, Kaffenberger and Lan Pritchett on loss of learning <coughs> and coming out of the, the same RISE program. Uh, some really useful work from Andrea B, Daniels and Das looking at duration effects of loss of learning uh, shocks. For ex in their case, looking at the Pakistan earthquake of 2005 and the duration of that, uh, the effects of that shock through the education system. Let me move very directly to the, the key policy conclusions, given the shortage of time. We're always going to face a serious challenge of calibration with models of this type, and that requires us to do a lot of sensitivity analysis. We've no space here to describe this in detail, but we believe that the results that are coming out of our analysis are plausible and compelling. Number one, the direct short-run economic effects of the COVID crisis have been and will continue to be brutal in many low-income countries. This is true for any calibration, any plausible calibration. And importantly, these are almost always out of proportion to the direct health costs of the pandemic itself, at least for the moment. Recovery is likely to be very slow um, and the distributional effects disturbing. This is a shock that bounce back is unlikely to be terribly rapid. The medium term effects may well be severely exacerbated through these loss of learning effects and diversion of health spending effects unless countries can commit to significant reconstruction process. But given the highly constrained fiscal uh, environments in which many low-income countries were operating in just prior to the crisis, fiscal adjustment burdens may be very severe and may not be politically feasible, the implication being that recovery is delayed even further. In such circumstances, the returns to effective external assistance are likely to be high, but will require extended engagement and a tolerance of high debt levels well into the future. My final slide just illustrates this, showing that in the short run, the shock to growth, to private investment, to incomes and, and uh, unemployment is likely to be very severe but more importantly, recovery is extremely slow. Recovery back to trend. Only if we are able to think about public investment programs that help return uh, productivity and hence private investment back to trend, do we have a hope of reversing some of the loss of development impacts that have occurred over recent years. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, so we still have uh, approximately eight minutes uh, for the end of the session. If uh, someone have any questions, please uh, type on the Q and A. So there is a question for Oras. So uh, Oras, if you can read in the Q and A uh, and and prepare your answer, I can start uh, first saying that thank you for everyone. I think this session was really important uh, discussing the impact of the pandemic on human capital is fundamental. And there was one thing that uh, all the papers here were discussing, that is the, the, the lack of data to analyze the impact of COVID on uh, human capital. And most of the papers here try to um, create some data, to collect some data, and also discuss the problem of, uh, with that. So uh, I, I would like to start the discussion uh, with a question to Kibron uh, about Kibron, uh, how do you think is the external validity of your results? 
because uh, it's really important, I think, your, your, your work, because now everyone is working with phone surveys. Uh, if you look, for example, to the World Bank, the World Bank basically conducted phone surveys for uh, almost all countries in Africa, in Latin America, uh, and we have this trade-off about uh, collecting more information and having uh, some bias in the uh, in the answer. So I would like to listen a little bit from you. Thanks. Um, yeah, we have been thinking about uh, the external validity of our findings, uh, and um, I think this is a valid question. I mean, um, we, and I think I mean the best I can tell is. Um, we are trying to uh, apply this in uh, in a face-to-face -face setting and also in uh, another phone survey. Um, but I agree that I mean, because also the context and the environment that you operate, um, this type of surveys would also matter. Um, so I, what the only thing I can tell is like we are trying to uh, get another round of survey with a similar uh, design both in a face-to-face -face survey and in a, in a phone survey setting. By then, I would be able to uh, tell more about whether our findings are uh, or take um, or assume some level of external validity. But for now, I think, I mean, uh, what I can tell is, I think internally our findings seem uh, to, to sound valid and intuitive. Thank you, Kibra. So we can move it to ours. Uh, or if you can answer the question in the key and day. I, I don't know if you are listening to me or because you are with your phone. Yeah, yes. perfect. No. Yes. So, yes, I'm, uh, I'm going to answer. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my response to Okay, so you are writing. Okay, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I can uh, finalize this with another question. Uh, I have a question for Elisa too. Uh, Elisa, what do you think about teachers' behavior? So do you try to address this question in your survey? Because we know that it's really difficult to talk about causality in this type of setting. Uh, but I also think that there is some teacher behavior uh, affecting grades and also dropouts, etc., during the pandemic. Uh, do you have anything to talk about it? Regarding, I mean, the, the first uh, result, it was about uh, no activity, that it's more similar to dropout, and that it's more like uh, students that enrolled to the career, but then they didn't do anything. So, I mean, that doesn't have to do with teachers, I think, in the sense that they didn't go to any class in at any moment. They just enrolled, but then they dropped out. So in that sense, teacher may not have an important role, but but yes, in grade for sure. Uh, I mean, in these results that I present, uh, we couldn't control for that. But what we are trying to work in it's like there are some. Uh, I mean, regarding the way that the the, the the classes were taught, we cannot do much, but we can do because we were like um, worried about the the online test uh, compared to in person. Test. So maybe what we are trying to do is to recap all the all courses that were done, like the evaluation test was done in the same way, way the, than the previous years. The ones that the, the test was done in person compared to the the courses where the, they changed the modality of evaluation and then see there if we have results. But now we are like trying to analyze course by course, which were the ones that changes and which were the ones that stay in the same modality. So we are trying to get that information to match with our administrative records of the results of the courses at the university. But yes, we, I mean, we think that that would be a, a way of thinking why grades are now higher. Maybe it's because, I mean, all the pandemics and also that the way of uh, getting the, the results are doing an online evaluation test. Thank you, Elisa. And uh, thank you for everyone that stayed with us until now. I think it was a great session. And now I, I need to finalize because we need to move to, to the fireside sessions. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.